What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we continue our series on the 21st Century Church. We are looking at a variety of topics and considering what it is that God has for us in this new century. Last week was Memorial Day and we looked at a particular memorial Joshua laid as Israel entered the Promised Land. We saw how the focus is not on the war itself and those who fight, but on the goal we are striving toward, which is peace among all people. We don't glorify war or choose violence. We work for a better world for everyone. That's who the church is called to be in this new century. And now we look at another topic. We have welcomed in new members to the church today, and we are exploring what God's call on our lives means. What does it really look like to be a member of a church And what about a member of this church? Grace United Methodist Church has its own culture and projects, but we have to check those against what God calls us to. Are we off course? We'll only know if we are taking the time to hear God's call in the first place. Our scripture for today is all about hearing God's call. Aaron is going to read for us today. We heard about the birth of the child Samuel a a few weeks ago. Today we jump ahead a few chapters to when Samuel was a boy living and serving in the temple with the prophet Eli. Samuel was asleep there hearing from God. But not all is well while Eli is the prophet in charge at the temple. Let's hear the story from 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, know that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. And from Mark chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. Jesus looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy Jesus. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Lord, make us an inclusive community, passionately following Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and our ears that we might hear your voice calling to us. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Samuel was just a boy when he heard God's voice. It happened in a time when few people heard from God. Uh, Today, we might feel like it's rare to hear from God. We could go our whole lives without a a single divine encounter hearing from God. Uh, I don't claim to have had visions or heard directly from the Lord, but I do think of my childhood where there were many moments where I felt like God was speaking to me. One was when I was a little, maybe seven or eight years old on an Easter Sunday, my mom had taken the time to type on a typewriter on index cards. She wrote a heartfelt message to each of her children of what she felt like God wanted to say to each of us. I remember on mine it said that I would be as tall as a skyscraper. Uh, It was memorable because at that age I was really interested in being a construction worker. Uh, I felt like that mention of a skyscraper confirmed that one day I would build skyscrapers. Uh, Thank your lucky stars that never happened. Looking back, I'm sure it would have been a disaster. I am not very good at construction. We'd have collapsing towers everywhere if I were in charge. But reflecting on what my mom wrote, I know she was affirming me. She was inspiring me and spurring me on to great things. I think it's the same thing God would have said to me. Then there's my dad. When I was about to graduate from high school, my church put together a big dinner celebration for all the graduates. Our families were invited to attend, and one by one, a parent would go up to the front of the room and share about their son or daughter. When it was my dad's turn, he shared about some of the gifts and talents he saw in me. He said how much he loved me and how proud of me he was. I can't think of another moment where my dad told me something like that. I felt again Like, that's what God would have told me if you were standing right there in front of me. I wonder with my own children if they'll ever have a moment like that. Something memorable where I say something or do something that makes them feel like they heard straight from God. I know it's rare. Most days go by so fast. Uh, My wife is away this weekend, and I was ready to throw the towel in three hours into her leaving. Now it's been three days and I need a break. I already prepped the trophy to give to her when she comes back that says, world's best mom. I spend a lot of time with my kids too, maybe more than many parents, but it all goes by so quick. Sometimes we have those important moments uh, when I lay down with them at night, I might read a few pages from a novel, but then we are quiet or they ask a reflective question that reminds me of, how proud of them I am, and how much they've grown. Who knows for sure if any of those times will stick with my children, though. All I know is that I love them tremendously, and I know God does too. Perhaps those quiet places we have to hear from God was some of what was at work in the story of Samuel. How do you hear from God? Well, he was laying down in the tabernacle, the large tent that also had the Ark of the Covenant in it. It was a place where many believed it was more likely to hear from God. You were close to holy things, so maybe if you paid attention, you could hear from God. It it was called incubation, and that's exactly what happens to Samuel. He is quiet, ready to sleep, then he hears a voice call. Three times it happens before Eli realizes Samuel is hearing not just from a person, but from God. So he tells him to lie down, and when he hears God again, he say, speak for your servant is listening. Samuel does as he's told, and that's where many sermons you hear on this story end. Look at that. Samuel heard from God, so be holy and listen closely so you can too. But if you keep reading, You hear that the message Samuel gets is not a very good one. Samuel hears from God that his father figure, the high priest Eli, is going to be punished. His children are awful, doing evil, and Eli just tolerates it. This is not acceptable to God. That isn't really the kind of thing we want to hear from God, is it? We'd much rather hear good news. 
But maybe there's something more to this bad news. In the chapter before this one, chapter 2, we have already heard about how bad Eli's children are. We already know that they are going to die by the sword for all the evil they do. And soon enough, it will happen. So this story is not so much about Samuel hearing God's voice or even the bad things going to happen to Eli's family. The point is that Samuel's mother, Hannah, who we talked about a few weeks ago, gives her child to Eli in the middle of all this. She knows Eli's children are nasty. She knows the temple life is not at all as it ought to be. She knows this is an environment a lot of people would not choose for their children. Who wants to have Eli's kids as the mentor for their children? And yet, here is Samuel. She still gives her child anyways, despite how bad the situation is. That means Samuel's presence in the temple has become a sign of hope and possibility. It seems others aren't that interested in listening, answering the call of God, but Samuel is. Samuel is living out the vision of his mother, growing up in a place that's corrupt and rotten. But because he is listening to God, a new day is coming for the temple. For us here today, we might be worried for the church. Our church might be okay, but we hear about churches down the street, church attendance in the United States, all the grief and heartache caused by the flaws and shortcomings of the church, and things might look pretty dark. But just like Samuel, when a baby gets baptized or new members join the church, it's a new day. There is hope and possibility for us. All it takes is a willing heart that will listen and answer the call. In our church, when we welcome in new members, they take vows. You heard them today. Those vows involve five areas where a person makes a commitment. They are prayer presence, gifts, service, and witness. Each of these areas is something that brings us hope in our church today as willing hearts say yes to God. Let me share a few words about each one as we consider what it means to answer the call of God. The first is prayer. It may seem simple to some, but a mystery to others. There are actually a lot of people that wonder, am I praying the right way? The answer is yes, Yes, you are doing it right. You don't have to be an expert or get a degree from a school to pray. You just do it. It's talking to God, building up that relationship, so pray as often as you can. And next is presence. Uh, We might think of showing up on Sunday morning for worship as our presence, which is great, uh, but it also means spiritual formation, small groups, missions, And the community activities we do, like fundraisers and family ministries, these are all things our presence helps in making the church vibrant and building us up. When we commit our gifts, the third area, we are saying we will give our time, our talent, and our tithes. Probably the most important thing we can do is to recognize the talents that we have and give of those things. It's often worth more than the money that we might give. If you don't know what your talent is, what you, what you have, take a spiritual gifts inventory. Call me or come, come and meet with me. We'll find what your gift is and how you can use it in response to God's call. But commit yourself to using your gifts to God's glory. Now, service is a key identity in Methodist, as John Wesley would say. We do good of every possible sort, and if as far as possible to all people. Oh, one woman in the women's group of the United Methodist Church is from Mozambique, where the girls work hard every day fetching water, collecting wood, preparing food, tending the fields, caring for children. But to break the cycle of poverty and inequality, what these girls needed was reading and writing. So that's exactly what this person did, and it helped change their lives. Here in the U.S., we have organizations for volunteer labor that does construction and disaster relief. The key is to put our bodies in places where people are in pain. 
to be with the lonely, to feed the hungry, because we know we find our life in serving others. And the last vow we make is to witness. Now, this can be scary for a lot of folks, but it can be as simple as telling someone your weekend plans include going to church. Everyone longs for a greater purpose and belonging, so tell people how you find those things through the church and your connection with God. That's witnessing. When we follow through on these vows as members of this church, we are bringing hope to the world, just like Samuel did serving in the temple. There is a light and life and hope when just one or two people choose to listen closely to God and to live to be a blessing to others. Imagine what it might be like to have the hundreds of members here at Grace doing exactly that. Let's end with this. Uh, Barnes United Methodist Church had a problem. There was a lot of gang violence in their neighborhood, and it was affecting their church. People were afraid to go to church because of what was happening around it. They didn't ignore the problem, though. They didn't bury their head in the sand. They looked at what they had, and they answered the call. Their congregation had a number of people who had once been drug dealers, convicts, and gang members. Those are people you might think can't bring much light or hope into the world, but they did. They went to the streets and met with these young people. They told them their own stories about the mistakes they had made and how it led to them going to jail. Uh, this coalition that they form says, we see ourselves as the light of Christ in the midst of these communities that are experiencing a lot of, of violence, poverty, lack of quality education, opportunities, and, and broken families. Our very presence there says to people that we care. Not only did the church's own neighborhood experience a, a dramatic decline in violence, but so did several other areas where they worked. One neighborhood celebrated a whole year with no death. Another is at over 1,000 days. That's something worth celebrating because people answered the call using what God gave them to bless the world. When we listen for the call of God found in our membership vows and respond to it, the world is changed around us. We see the beginnings of the 21st century church that God wants for all of us. So be like Samuel. Be like our new members here today and commit yourself to a time of incubation, to hear from God, and then to answer the Lord's call. It will be a blessing to you, to the church, and to the whole world. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.